Morning, everybody. Please take a seat. You are a very obedient group, sitting down nicely. Good to, good to have you here with us this morning and uh, a welcome to people who are visiting and to the regulars and also to those who are joining us online today. Let's stand and sing our first song, which is Oh Praise the Name. Let's stand. Isn't that a great hymn? 
Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. For those who don't know me, my name is Terry. I'm uh, one of the leaders of services here, and uh, it's good to meet you. If I haven't met you already, I'll see you later. There's morning tea afterwards, so we can get to know people a bit better. In the song we just sang, O oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. It's the name of God which is prominent right through the Old Testament. But Michael has been taking us through the book of Acts and we're up to chapter 4 today that he's speaking on. And there's a verse there that's almost a summary verse for what we're, what we're doing today. And it says in chapter 4, verse 12, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, in the context, that's the name of Jesus. And actually, in those chapters at the start of Acts, I counted nine times where it talks about the name of Jesus. We pray in the name of Jesus. We're baptised in the name of Jesus. People are healed in the name of Jesus. And overall, there's salvation in the name of Jesus. Michael will make that plainer to us later on. So thank God for his word and praise God for his son, the Lord Jesus. Let's pray prayer of preparation. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and we magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. And our prayer we call the collect is on the screen. Let's say together. Father of all, who gave your only begotten Son to take upon himself the form of a servant and to be obedient even to death on a cross, Give us the same mind that was in Christ Jesus, that sharing in his humility, we may come to be with him in his glory, where he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Michael's going to bring us the notices. Fantastic. Thanks, Terry. Well, it's great to be able to welcome you here to St. John's, as Terry said earlier. Uh, my name's Michael, and I'm uh, one of the ministers here, um, and it's great to have you here this morning, either in person or online. Uh, if this is your first time or uh, you're wanting to know some more information about St. John's, a great way to do that is by filling out one of these uh, Connect cards. Uh, if you're joining us online, you can go to our website as well and fill that out online, and uh, someone will be in contact with you this week. Well, we have a couple of birthdays this week that we are celebrating, so happy birthday to Bill and Rose. Let's give thanks for Bill and Rose. Uh, Heavenly Father, we uh, give you so much thanks for Bill and for Rose and for their encouragement to us and how you're at work in and through them and how they are such an encouragement to us. And so we pray that you would bless this new year of their life uh, and help them to have a great day uh, celebrating their birthdays this week. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there are a number of things happening in February. Uh, if you haven't received uh, this notice yet in the e-news, come and let me know and I can send it to you. Uh, but just a few highlights. Uh, today we're going to be having our prayer meeting after the service. Um, you can also find the prayer points for this term up the back in this nice little booklet which Chris prepared. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, and you'll be able to um, pray each day for our church. There's a prayer point for each day. Um, but after the service, we're going to particularly commit um, our plans to the Lord in prayer. Uh, also, you can join us in prayer every Tuesday uh, at 8 a.m. on Zoom. The details to join that Zoom link are on the e-news, uh, and that's a great way to commit our church and our lives to God in prayer. Uh, then also this week, our Ladies' Fellowship is starting again on Tuesday morning, so if you're part of that, uh, make sure that you note that. Then on Wednesday, uh, our cafe catch-ups are starting again, so I'd love to see you there at Chenzo's on Lumley Street for a chance to catch up at 9.30 a.m. Uh, we've got a working bee coming up on Saturday to be able to do some bit of mowing, bit of cleaning, bit of uh, maintenance work inside the building. There's, uh, there's, we're not short of jobs to be able to do, so come along to that. 
And just a, a couple of date claimers is that on the uh, 25th of uh, this month, we're going to be having our AGM part two. Uh, last year, we had our AGM part one to elect our office bearers. And then we're going to be having our AGM part two to approve the budget for this year and also receive the reports. And then also, I got this out of order, but also next Sunday uh, afternoon, we're going to be having our church afternoon tea at Ross and Penny's place. Uh, if you want to RSVP for that, please do so and have a chat to Penny afterwards and she'll be able to jot your name down for that. And I think that is all that I've got to mention. It's now time for our kids to go out, so how about I pray for them and for Malcolm, uh, who's taking them out. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, which speaks to all ages and all generations. And so we pray that, uh, that in this time that you help Malcolm and the kids to be able to grow in the knowledge and understanding of your word and love of you. And we pray that St. John's may be a place where all generations will be able to come and know of the name of Jesus. And so we pray this in your name. Amen. It's time for our Bible readings. The first reading comes from Genesis 19, and you can find that on page 14 in the Church Bibles. Lot and his daughters have fled from God's judgment on Sodom to the nearby city of Zoar. Genesis 19 beginning at verse 30. Now Lot went up out of Zoar and lived in the hills with his two daughters, for he was afraid to live in Zoar. So he lived in a cave with his two daughters. And the firstborn said to the younger, our father is old and there's not a man on earth to come into us after the manner of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine and we will lie with him that we may preserve offspring from our father. So they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father. He did not know when she lay down or when she arose. The next day, the firstborn said to the younger, Behold, I lay last night with my father. Let us make him drink wine tonight also. Then you go in and lie with him, that we may preserve offspring from our father. So they made their father drink wine, and that night also. And the younger arose and lay with him, and he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. Thus, both the daughters of Lot became pregnant by their father. The firstborn bore a son and called his name Moab. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. The younger also bore a son and called his name Ben-Ami. He is the father of the Ammonites to this day. We now turn to the New Testament, uh, to Acts chapter 4. You can find this on page 912. Peter and John have been arrested for healing a lame man and they're now brought before the Jewish authorities. Acts chapter 4, beginning at verse 5. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set Peter and John in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by which means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, 
For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished and they recognised that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach it all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people for all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Before Michael comes to speak to us on that passage, Let's stand and we'll say together our creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried ascended to the dead. On the third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, I believe in the Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you, Terry. Uh, it'll be great if you could have that Bible reading open in front of you from Acts chapter 4. Uh, that can be found on page 913 of the Church Bibles. Um, that would be really handy. And I'll just make sure I can change the slides up here. Great. Uh, let's pray as we get started. Gracious Lord, your word is a light unto our feet and a lamp unto our path. And so we pray that you would lighten the way that you would teach us, that you would equip us, that you would rebuke us, that you would inspire us, that you would encourage us uh, to live and serve you, live for and serve you, and see Jesus. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, nobody really likes doing hard things. Nine times out of ten, a lot of people will choose the easy option or the, the path of least resistance when, uh, when faced with a particularly difficult situation. Uh, when that alarm goes off at 5 a.m. or even earlier for that morning workout, I've got to tell you, it's oh so easy to hit that stop button and turn over and go back to sleep. Uh, when the corner shop is really just a two-minute walk, it's very easy just to hop in the car and sit in the nice air con to get up to the shop. Or when that task is due next week, it's so much easier to put it off until then and do something much more fun right now. <laughs> Or maybe I've just revealed far too much about my lack of discipline as your minister. <laughs> Today, we're going to see Peter and John come up against their first hard situation after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus. Uh, everything so far has been going great for them. The church has been growing in, in leaps and bounds. Someone has even been healed, as we saw last week. 
But today, we're going to see the first sneak peek at the opposition to the gospel after the ascension of Jesus. But even in the face of this opposition, Peter and John don't back down, nor do they change their message, but they continue to be committed to the preaching of the gospel to a world that needs it. They know that Jesus is the only hope for this world. They know that they have been given a mission to tell the world about him, to be his witnesses in the world. And so they don't back down from their mission. They do the hard thing. They pray for boldness and help to do that hard thing. And what we're going to see today as we go through this passage is that in the face of opposition, the gospel of Jesus Christ must and can still be told. So remember the chaotic scenes of last week. Peter and John were in the temple courts just after uh, healing the man who was born lame. Peter preached to them, declaring that Jesus is the Messiah, that this man was healed by the power and the authority of Jesus. Peter once again tells them, don't miss out on seeing that Messiah. And the news of this spread, that the chaotic scenes have drawn attention. And now it's getting late. And the Sadducees have come down to the temple with the temple police, with the temple guard. Uh, the Sadducees were part of the ruling class of the Jewish eldership at that time. They didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. Uh, they believed that this life was all that there is, and so the idea of resurrection was completely wrong to them. So Peter is proclaiming that Jesus is the Messiah and that Jesus rose from the dead, two things which they didn't quite like. And so because of the chaos and because they were spreading this teaching, they have Peter and John arrested. They keep them in overnight. See, up until uh, this time, everything seemed like it was going swimmingly for the apostles. But here's the first hurdle, the first opposition. However, this didn't take the mission of Jesus off track. While the apostles were in prison... Luke, who, remember, is the author of Acts, Luke writes this in uh, chapter 4, verse 4. Look with me. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and a number of men came to about 5,000. The apostles may have been arrested, but the word of God wasn't. The number of believers grew. It grew by 5,000, or it grew up to 5,000. Even though the messengers may have been stopped or held back or stopped in their tracks, nothing can stop the spread of the word of God. And in fact, we should know that we as messengers are just really clay pots for the gospel or Chinese takeaway containers. The power doesn't reside in us, but from the message that we proclaim. Jesus will still build his church. I'm so thankful that here in Australia, we have great freedom to proclaim openly about Jesus. We can fully preach the gospel. I can confidently preach that Jesus Christ is the Messiah and Lord of all and that salvation can only be found in him and no one from the government is going to cut our live stream or bash down the doors, as far as I know. Uh, yes, it is a different story in our workplaces. There is a time and place. But even if we were to share Jesus with a close friend or family member, they can't report it to the police to have you arrested. But even if that were the case, if we were thrown in jail, if we were muzzled, nothing can stop the word of God from spreading. The growth comes from Jesus. We just have to be faithful in proclaiming him. Uh, but Peter and John are now in the cells of the Jewish leaders, and now the council gets together. So look at me from verse 5. On the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem, with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? These blokes are the big wigs. These are the ruling class, the top educated, the top of the leadership of the nation of Israel. Uh, Annas and Caiaphas we know about. Uh, Annas was the ex-high priest. Caiaphas was probably his son-in-law. 
Uh, we don't know too much about John and Alexander, but we actually do know that these people would have been in the room with Jesus at the time of his arrest and trial. Remember, they took Jesus first to the high priest's house and then to Pilate and then sent them back to Herod and then back to Pilate. These guys would have been there pushing for the death of Jesus by crucifixion. And here these same people are looking at these disciples who continue to spread this message of Jesus. Remember, we're still probably within 100 days of those events of Good Friday and Easter Day. And so they have this simple question of Peter and John. How did they do the healing? Of course, that's not really their question at all because if someone is healed, you don't put someone who healed them on trial. No, you thank them. And so Peter sees through this. He is given boldness from the Holy Spirit to proclaim, just as Jesus promised. And he says that if they want to know who really did the healing, it was by Jesus. Jesus, who is the Messiah. Jesus, who they crucified. But Jesus, who is now alive and risen and in power. It's through this Jesus that the man became healed. It's through Yahweh in flesh, who they tried to put to death. But God rose from the dead. The evidence is right there. Note that the, the man who was healed, the man who they knew for 40 years who had been lame, was standing right there beside them. Not sitting, standing right there beside him. And so Peter draws this conclusion in verse 11. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. This theme of uh, the stone being rejected, becoming the cornerstone, is one which is familiar to us. It's familiar in the Bible. Uh, the rejected stone was the one which the builder picked up off the pile, looked at, saw that it wasn't fit for purpose, discarded it off the pile. Kind of like a tennis player getting a few balls to serve. They throw one with the one which they don't like. The cornerstone in a building was seen as the most important piece because it is the first stone that is laid. It's the stone from which the whole building gets its orientation and sizing, its foundations, its trajectory, it takes it from the cornerstone. It's really important. Uh, this is seen in, in Psalm 118, verse 22, which is uh, classically interpreted as the Jewish nation being rejected but becoming the cornerstone, which says, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. We also see this, uh, this theme in Luke 20, where Jesus quotes this verse to the teachers and the elders. He does this to refer to himself. Jesus is the son who's going to be rejected and killed, but he is the son who's going to build his new people, to have his foundation on them. And Peter is saying and making it clear to these leaders of the nation, Jesus is that stone. Jesus was rejected, humiliated, killed, but now Jesus has been vindicated. The Jewish leaders have been proven wrong God has reversed their actions. Jesus is now the foundation of a new building. The Son has been glorified. Jesus is the centerpiece, the cornerstone, the foundation for all who believe. And then chapter 4, verse 12, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. It's only through this cornerstone that people must find their salvation from their captivity to sin and to death. No other name, no other way through, only through Jesus. And notice, this isn't just good advice. Uh, Peter isn't saying here that it's through Jesus that people should be saved or may be saved or might be saved. No, through Jesus, the people must be saved. 
One of the more hairy events in my life, and I think Rach might agree with this, was directing Rach's grandfather down the Blue Mountains uh, to try and get us to Sydney Airport about one and a half years ago. So I was back in, my, in the back on my phone, giving him directions from Google Maps, while he was having a great time chatting away and, and telling us about his life story. Uh, we were approaching a big intersection, and with about five kilometres to go, with traffic building up, I said, Papa, you, you should probably get into the right-hand lane. It was a, it was a suggestion. Uh, then five kilometres became three kilometres, became one kilometre, became 500 metres. That suggestion turned into a must. You must get into the right-hand lane. Otherwise, we're going to be heading to Newcastle. <laughs> Salvation through Jesus isn't just a suggestion. It's a must. We can only find salvation in him. There are no other routes. Not by our good works. Not by anyone else. Only through Jesus. If you are here today, or joining us online for the first time, this is what we're on about here at St. John's. Jesus. Proclaiming Jesus the cornerstone. He is good news for you. Forgiveness and eternal life and refreshment and reconciliation with God can be found in Jesus through trusting in him, having faith in him. And if you want this, it's yours today. All you need to do is say sorry for living against his ways and turning towards him. Salvation can be yours today. The reaction from uh, Peter's speech was one of speechlessness and astonishment. They couldn't believe the boldness of these blokes who didn't have a bachelor's degree, they didn't go to Bible school, they didn't have the training that they had. Uh, because these guys, remember, Peter and John were from the working class. They were fishermen. But the healed man was right here. <laughs> they couldn't refute what they were saying. They didn't have any answers to the resurrection of Jesus. You know, if they did have the answers, if they knew that Jesus didn't actually raise from the dead, if they had any evidence, they could have brought it out right there. They could have nipped this thing right in the bud, right back there, right then, present the evidence, present the body, and nail this whole church movement, Jesus movement down. But they couldn't. They didn't. Jesus was really risen. And so their only solution was to try and silence Peter and John. They couldn't do a theological investigation. They resorted to pragmatism. <laughs> they were losing their authority as leaders politically. There was beginning of uprising in Jerusalem, which wouldn't have been good news for the Romans. And so they attempted to stop Peter and John, but with little effect. Uh, look with me from verse 17. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must be the judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. Uh, Peter and John kindly told them, no. We're going to obey God rather than you. God has told us to go and witness to Jesus, so we're going to go do that. They even went so far as to say that they couldn't help but speak about Jesus. Speaking about Jesus was as natural to breathing as them. It was as essential as breathing to them. They have to speak about Jesus, which also meant disobeying the council. <laughs> There's a bit of civil disobedience happening here. 
Now, we have to remember that as Christians, we are called to be obedient to our authorities and the law of the land set before us. This includes civil laws and responsibilities. But until this goes against the law of God, so if there is ever a time where evangelism becomes illegal in the law of Australia, I don't think that's going to happen, then we will continue preaching Jesus. Uh, this is what is happening in a lot of the rest of the world where proselytizing is illegal. In China, in Tibet, in Western Europe. And where's the gospel growing the most? China, <laughs> Tibet, Western Europe. Keep on preaching the gospel until our dying breath as naturally and as normally as breathing. Again, the council couldn't decide what to do. They have the crowds outside praising God for what they have seen, and if they punished Peter and John, then they would have faced lynching from these crowds. So they can only release them. So, Peter and John, they go back to their mates, tell them what's happened, and their first response is to pray. But the contents of their prayer is really quite surprising. You know, just put yourselves in their shoes at this point. Think about if you were there back in the day. They've just been in jail overnight. They've been told not to speak in Jesus' name. They've been threatened with further punishment if they speak in Jesus' name. They've just faced like a Senate inquiry in Canberra. What would you be praying for? I think that I'd be praying for safety, uh, protection, that there would be no more scary opposition. But that's not what the apostles pray for. They pray for boldness. They pray for courage to do the hard thing. They pray for courage to preach the gospel. They knew that opposition was real. They knew that it was inevitable. They prayed that they would be faithful, bold proclaimers. In the first part of their prayer, they address God in adoration, giving God the praise and the honor as the one who is in control of everything. They quote Psalm 2, which is a well-known messianic psalm, which says that the God's anointed is going to be rejected. And then they say this in chapter 4, verse 27. For truly in the city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. They knew that the opposition was going to happen. And then verse 29. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of Jesus. They ask God to give them opportunity to speak the gospel with boldness. They ask God to be at work giving the signs and the miracles and the wonders to prove that Jesus is the Lord. Not, please Lord, take away the threats. Not, Lord, keep us safe from persecution. But, Lord, give us boldness. Now, this is a great model prayer for us. Opposition to the gospel is natural because the gospel actually confronts people. The gospel challenges people. The gospel of Jesus demands a response from people to see their sin for what it is and the punishment that it deserves and to turn to Jesus as Lord. It demands a response from people to stop living with themselves as number one but to live with Jesus as number one. So of course there's going to be opposition. Of course there's going to be confrontation. So we've got a few options. We could stop preaching. We could stop proclaiming in order to not cause offense. Well, that's not being faithful to God's call to witness, is it? Our second option is that we could water down the message we could turn the gospel into the news that God loves you or that God wants you to live your best life. And yes, well, God does love the world and God does want us to live our best life in relationship with him. 
But if that's the only message that we tell people, then people will say, oh, isn't that nice? And go along their merry way thinking, God loves me, without actually turning to him. That's why watering down the message or liberalism is a fool's errand. That's why churches close. Or we could join in the apostles' prayer, praying for boldness to preach the full gospel, making the gospel as accessible as possible, preaching it in creative ways, but not being surprised when people reject it. So I want to entreat you. Could you please keep on praying this for St. John's? Keep on praying this for yourselves? Keep on praying this for me? Because as we've already seen in this series, salvation is freely available to all through Jesus. If you have turned to him, then this salvation is yours. You are safe and secure in him. You are safe from the sting of sin and death. You're secure. And shouldn't we want that security and hope for our world as well? In a world that's so lost, in a world where people are so insecure, we have the answer. It's Jesus. We have the hope of the world, the way to life. And it's not just like a good recommendation, like your recommendation for a scone recipe. It's not just a good suggestion, but it's good, radically, life-changing news. So let's do the hard thing. Tell people about him. Because there is no other way by which we can be saved only through Jesus. Let's finish in prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you for the salvation which is found in Jesus. We thank you for the hope, the security, the refreshment that we have all in the name of Jesus. So we pray that you would help us to be bold in proclaiming his name and his news to a world that so desperately needs it. Lord, we pray that you would give us creativity with which to share this gospel message. We pray that you will give us perseverance. We pray that you will keep us fervent in prayer and reliance on you. And we pray that your spirit would be at work opening the eyes of those people whom we love so dearly, softening those hearts, opening up those ears to hear just how good and glorious you are. Lord, please be at work in and amongst us so there may be a world in this pocket of Australia that knows Jesus. And we pray all this in his name. Amen. Please stand as we continue in song.
As we pray today, when I say, Father, hear our prayer, the response will be, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Please join with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for all that you are. You are our creator, sustainer, redeemer, saviour, our solid rock, and our loving Father, the one who knows and cares for each of us intimately. You are in control of all things and know all things. Nothing happens outside of you. Thank you that we can rest in the security of knowing that you are in control of everything, including our lives. We thank you for all that you've done to reveal yourself to us and to save us from our sin that separated us from you. Thank you that because of Jesus' death and resurrection, 
All who trust in him have the sure hope of forgiveness and an eternal future with you in heaven. We don't deserve such love or forgiveness, and yet you lavish it on us anyway. Lord, we confess that we are too easily distracted. We are selfish, unkind, unloving, impatient, and unfaithful. We desperately need your mercy and forgiveness that are on offer in Jesus. Please help us to keep our eyes fixed on him each and every day. Help us to live our lives for him and for your glory. Help us to boldly proclaim your name and share your love and grace to those around us. May we as a church family be people who stick to the gospel and boldly preach the truth about Jesus to those around us. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord, please be with our church family near and far. We pray for Michael and for our wardens, Ross, Tommy and Jason, and for all those on parish council. Please be with these brothers and sisters and give them your wisdom, love and humility as they serve you and your body here. We continue to pray for those in need in our church family and especially think of Marilyn and Warwick, Beres, Barry and Elaine, Elizabeth and Emma, Rosemary, Sylvia, Penny, Tony and Faye, Isabel, Cassie and Peter, Anita and Sue, Gwen, Miriam and Graham, Wayne and Jeff, and all others who are in need at this time. We also lift up before you those who are grieving and for all those who spend much of their time caring for others. Please strengthen, comfort and encourage each of them and surround them with your love and peace. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We also lift up to you Nathan and D Diane Lovell with Shiri and Isaac, who serve with CMS at George Whitfield College in Cape Town. Thank you for their ministry over there, and we ask your blessing on them. Please be with all the new students who've arrived at the college recently, and we pray for those who are still waiting on visas, that these will be processed very quickly to allow them to commence studying this year. We pray for the many various things happening in the life of the Lovell family and the college community at large. Please may your hand be over everything that happens there and may you be deepening relationships, growing everyone in Christ likeness and helping them all to find their rest and joy in you. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We pray also for our wider community here in Wishart and surrounds young and old. Thank you for this lovely area that we are blessed to live in and be part of. Please be with our community in their day-to-day -day needs and please be using us to love and bless our neighbours and those around us. We think too of all of the school chaplains in our local schools, for Anne-Marie at Mansfield Primary, Ben at Upper, Magra Upper Mount Gravatt Primary, Sue at Mansfield High, Boone at McGregor High, and for Joel who coordinates and supports all chaplaincy in this region. We pray that their ministry would be fruitful and that would, you would be using them to shine the light of Christ to the school students, parents, and staff they work with. We also pray for Wishart School, who have recently decided to employ a secular student wellbeing officer rather than a chaplain. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Finally, Father, we pray for our world. We pray for all those worldwide who are hurting and struggling due to war, famine, poverty, natural disasters, disease, or other hardships. Please be with them and comfort them. May they know your love and care, and may they hear and cling to the good news of Jesus and may it give them hope in the midst of their hardships. Please convict us, Lord, to keep praying for them and to pray too for our Christian brothers and sisters worldwide who are seeking to make you known in their different contexts. We pray all these things through Jesus' name, who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. One of the great rhythms and patterns here that we have at St. John's is celebrating the Lord's Supper together and also coming weekly to God in confession and saying sorry, saying sorry for those times we haven't lived with him as our Lord, but also basking and, and rejoicing in his forgiveness and love of us through Jesus. So we're going to do that right now. Hear these words from Isaiah 55. Seek the Lord while he may be found... Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord that he have, may have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. So therefore, knowing the goodness of God and our failure to respond with love and obedience, let us confess our sins, saying together, Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have broken your holy laws and have left undone what we ought to have done. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us, and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God is slow to anger and abounding in compassion, forgiving all who humbly repent and trust in his Son as Saviour and Lord. God therefore forgives you in Christ Jesus, in whom there is no condemnation. Amen. And from 1 Peter. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you are straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Well, in this good news, would you please stand? Brothers and sisters, we are the body of Christ. The peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. Please share a sign of peace with someone nearby. As we come back together and prepare for the Lord's Supper, let's, uh, let's sing.
Please be seated. Well, as we come to celebrate the Lord's Supper today, you are, you're more than welcome to join us if you call Jesus your Saviour and Lord, if you turn to Jesus. Uh, today, if you come down the front, I'll give you a piece of gluten-free bread, and if you take a small cup of grape juice from Hugh beside me, and take it back to your seats, and we'll eat and drink together as a sign of our unity and fellowship together, and then you can put your cups at the end of the service in the bowl of the back. That would be really helpful. But as we've already heard from Acts, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Therefore, lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power, for you created all things, making us in your own image. We praise you for your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who by his death on the cross and rising to new life, offered the one true sacrifice for sin and obtained an eternal deliverance for his people. Therefore, we lift our voices to praise you, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and mind, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. And now, gracious God, we thank you for these gifts of bread and wine. And we pray that we who receive them in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, according to our Saviour's word, in remembrance of his suffering and death, may share his body and blood. From the night before he died, Jesus took bread. And when he had given you thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup. And again, giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We eat this bread and drink this cup to proclaim the death of the Lord. We do this until he returns. Come, Lord Jesus. Father, as we recall his saving death and glorious resurrection, May we who share these gifts be renewed by your Holy Spirit and united in the body of your Son. Bring us with all your people into the joy of your eternal kingdom, there to feast at your table and join in your eternal praise. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive praise and honour and glory and power forever and ever. Amen.
the perfect spotless lamb, bruised, crucified, died, taking the punishment that we deserve. So take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. In the blood which was shed, sealing the new covenant, drink this in remembrance that Christ died for you and be thankful. Gracious God, thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the body and blood of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Thank you for assuring us of your goodness and love and that we are living members of Christ's body together. Father, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Please stand as we conclude in singing.
peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Please join us for some morning tea and then join us for prayer after the service.